So thank you all for, uh, for being here. Guy, thank you for inviting us. Uh, the topic uh, of our presentation is, did you know questions people ask about developing effective microlearning? And my name is Rene Corbet, Joseph Rene Corbet, but I go by Rene. Uh, I'm a professor of educational technology at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And I've been involved in education for about 40 years. The first 15 years teaching computer literacy to eighth graders. The last 25 years have been in higher education, teaching fully online for the fully online Master of Education in Educational Technology. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Elena Corbet. I'm professor of educational technology at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. For over 20 years, I've been designing, developing, and teaching fully online courses in undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral ed tech courses. Thank you for joining us. And over the past five years, Maria Elena and I have been have researched, written, and presented extensively on the topic of microlearning. And in 2021, we published a co-edited book titled Microlearning in the Digital Age with Dr. Badrul Khan, who's a leader in the e-learning field. Throughout our presentation, we'll be presenting research on various aspects of microlearning design from various contributors of our book, okay? So with that, we can go ahead and get started. In this presentation, we'll discuss how microlearning is not a new concept, how uh, it has variable links uh, based on the purpose and context of the microlearning event, is one of the fastest growing educational trends worldwide, and it has a promising future. And although there's no single unified theory of microlearning, currently research on key characteristics of microlearning is well established. We'd like to share with you that we've allotted 10 minutes for our 30 minute presentation for questions and discussion. So please post your questions in the chat or be ready to share them at the end. So in this presentation, we'll address several questions people ask about developing effective microlearning. So let's get started. Did you know that microlearning is booming? But people ask, what is it? Fun fact, microlearning is not a one-dose solution. It should be part of a bigger comprehensive training strategy. And the microlearning market is predicted to grow worldwide by just over 1.6 billion US dollars between 2022 and 2026. But people ask, what is it exactly? Badrul Khan, one of our co-editors and co-contributors to our microlearning book, defines microlearning as a single objective unit that is focused, outcome-based, standalone, and meaningful. It's delivered in bite-sized snippets and delivered digital or non-digital. So it was really nice to see that Ben's gonna be doing one on infographics, I can't wait. Did you know that microlearning is not a new concept? Uh, so one of the questions that we often get is how far back does it go? Fun fact, the first documented example of microlearning happened on July 14th at 2.22 PM, 1.8 million years ago. Growth Engineering, an online learning company based in the UK, humorously documented the first example of microlearning as Dave, the Homo erectus, passes on his knowledge to others through short uh, tutorials. And we can envision what the first three tutorials might have looked like. Lesson one, gathering moss. Lesson two, finding the right sticks and flint. And lesson three, starting the fire. If you think about it, microlearning is one of the oldest forms of learning. It was invented the moment people started to share information with each other, and it developed even further when people started to read and write. The era of the World Wide Web brought microlearning to the masses, and today the popularity of microlearning as a training technique has escalated on a global scale. Um, here are a couple of highlights on the history of microlearning, and this is by no means uh, comprehensive. I just took some of the ones that I thought might be interesting for us to, to know about. The concept, the actual concept of microlearning was based on Herman Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve that explains how people lose about 80% of the knowledge they learned within a, within a month. 
In the 1950s, B.F. Skinner came, to, came up with the program learning, which theorized that learning is best accomplished by small incremental steps with immediate reinforcement. And in 1956, George A. Miller came up with Miller's Law, which posited that humans can hold seven plus or minus two bits of information in short-term memory. So if you think about the, just these three alone, it kind of gives us an idea of why microlearning is more effective when it's short. Um, did you know that the first published use of the term of microlearning is, was in 1963 in the Economics of Human Resources by Hector Correa. Um, in 2005, Theo Hug popularized the concept of microlearning in the context of e-learning uh, through a presentation he gave titled Microlearning, a New Pedagogical Challenge, Introductory Note, at the first conference on microlearning. And then through the growth of social media in the 2000s, through apps and sites like Wikipedia, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Khan Academy, these ushered in an era of social learning whereby people learned from and with each other. The release of the iPhone in 2007 prompted the rapid adoption of sm smartphones, leading to the skyrocketing, sky skyrocketing of mobile learning and micro learning. And uh, in, 20, in the 2010s, uh, probably I would say around 2015, digital and micro credentials began to take off. In recent years, we've seen employers have begun to recognize the value of these credentials on people's resumes. And today, microlearning is a multi-billion dollar industry that's adopted by schools, colleges, and corporate offices worldwide. And as you can see from the highlights that Rene presented, the, the history, the background of microlearning is sprinkled not just with technology, but very important and significant learning theories. So did you know that research on microlearning is well established? But people ask, what are some of the theoretical underpinnings that support microlearning? Fun fact, by 2021, there were over 470 peer reviewed studies that have been published on the topic. Fun fact, the secret to microlearning is not making things short, it's making short things matter. So what are some of the theoretical underpinnings supporting microlearning? We're still left with that question. And as Rene and I started to delve into this question, we discovered that for us, the theories that helped us the most were the ones that supported the key characteristics of microlearning. So as you can see on the table on the left, we've listed some of the most important characteristics of microlearning that align with the definition we presented earlier short, visual, just in time, interactive, engaging, and social. Guy shared with us that in a few days or, or as a part of these trainings and professional developments, there will be sessions on making microlearning social. And that's really important. These theories that you see on the right, cognitive load, chunking, space recognition, andragogy, problem-based learning, social learning, communities of practice are just a few of the ones that support the key characteristics of microlearning. And they've helped us not only identify quality microlearning for our learners, but they've helped us learn how to develop effective microlearning content for different purposes. Today, for the sake of time, we're only gonna highlight two, but we invite you to delve deeper into the ones that interest you the most. The one that to us is one of the most important theories is cognitive load theory that John Sweller first published on in 1988. Simply put, cognitive load is the amount of information that working memory can hold at one time. So a really clear example is if we're driving to work, a place that we go to several or more times a week, it's a sunny day, no construction. We can talk with our coworkers. We can listen to the radio and even have a cup of coffee, uh, even have a cup of coffee on the way into work. However, if the situation changes and we find ourselves on an icy winding road, now our mind, our brain has to focus on the one task at hand, 
driving. So what does this mean for microlearning? And for us as developers and consumers of microlearning, well, only include activities and content that contribute directly to the learning outcome. Remember the key characteristics and the definition? Focused, single outcome. Another theory that has been really important to us, very significant, are the principles of multimedia learning by John Mayer. He first published these in 2001 and then revised them to come to date with current technologies in 2021. There are over 12 principles. They are research-based and they provide very specific guidance, but that still give you all the creativity in the world on how to develop multimedia. And multimedia is a huge component of microlearning. So for the sake of time today, we'll review one, the multimedia principle. On the screen, you're seeing some graphics created by Didam Tufan, one of the contributors to a chapter in the book. In her very interesting chapter, she presents what the multimedia principles are and strategies for using them for the development of effective microlearning. And you could see that on the left with the red background is a graphic with only text. And what do you see on the right? The text is divided into three graphics a little bit differently, right? With balanced with images and much less text. So what do you think the multimedia principle tells us? That's right. People learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. It seems like we all know this, right? But Mayer's principles can be printed or kept on a digital document and used as a checklist so that as we design or consume micro learning, we can use his principles to keep in check what we want for best practices for the design of multimedia. Did you know that microlearning can range from a few seconds to over an hour in length? So one of the questions we often hear is, so how long should microlearning be? Here's a fun fact. The myth about goldfish having longer attention spans than humans is not based in fact. In reality, attention spans are situational. People tend to pay attention to the things that are important to them. Think about a kid playing a video game and trying to pry them off of that video game, they'll forget to eat. They'll forget to do their chores. They'll forget everything while they're focusing on that one thing that is the most important thing to them at that moment. So that kind of helps us to, to, when we develop our multimedia, our, our micro learning, if we don't have to be worried about attention spans as much. Yes, people are distracted, and those are that's something totally different. So when we when we think about how long it should be, you know, there are several experts out there that have you know given their suggestions. For example, ATD research in in a study they conducted in 2017 suggests that um, longer than two minutes, but shorter than five minutes. Uh, Carl Kapp and Robin Depolis. Uh, Carl Kapp was a contributor to our book. He actually wrote the, the forward to it, suggests that it should be as uh, short as a few seconds to as long as an hour. Carla Torgerson and Sue Ioni, who are also contributors, said that with informal learning, it should last about four minutes or less. And J.D. Dillon, chief learning architect at Exonify, says that it should last as short as possible to address a specific measurable objective, but fit within the audience's available time. And we we kind of based, if we look at all of these definitions, we kind of like J.D. Dillon's uh, the most. Uh, we recommend that make your micro lessons as short as necessary, but as, as short as possible, but as long as necessary to address the specific measurable objective while taking into consideration the learner's limited available time. Uh, Torgerson and Ioni um, developed, uh, they, they came up with four different uses of microlearning. And to determine the appropriate links, uh, they basically categorize them into these four different categories. The first one they refer to as pre-work. This is microlearning that's assigned prior to a, a formal learning event. And they say that it can take up to 10 minutes. 
Then the second category is boosted learning, which is assigned as a follow-up of a recently completed learning event. And that can be short, about one minute in length. The short form learning is broken up into informal learning, which is what the learner wants to learn and know, and formal learning, which is what the learner needs to know. And for informal learning, they recommend a, a duration of about four minutes. For more formal learning, up to eight minutes. And then their fourth category or use of microlearning is performance su support, which is usually delivered on demand uh, to support workplace skills. And these can range anywhere from five seconds to five minutes. Think about a, a, an infographic as one, as an example of something that could take about five minutes, five seconds to consume, where it has a lot of important information presented uh, with charts and graphs and, and uh, very uh, small amount of text. And as we think of the theoretical underpinnings, even the eight minute length, uh, consider looking deeply into chunking, because even within an eight minute length micro learning unit, it doesn't have to run you know, completely consecutive, the content can be chunked depending on your learners, you know, you know them best. So did you know that micro learning is one of the fastest growing educational trends worldwide? But I'm sure by this point you're asking, and many of you already know because you're professionals in the field, what's the future of micro learning? Fun fact, as early as 2017, that's five years ago already, isn't that crazy? 81% of organizations surveyed worldwide were using or already planning to use microlearning. Fun fact, in 2018, microlearning accounted for just over 60% of all e-learning. And by 2025, mobile learning will become the microlearning mode of choice, as predicted by Denton. And so as we look at the theories, the history that Rene highlighted, and where we're going, what's the future of micro learning? Two contributors to our book, Hall and Hamilton, wrote a really fun and significant chapter on the future of micro learning in educational and all kinds of corporate settings. The ones that are the most significant to us and the most fun for us are they say that augmented and virtual reality will start to engage learners in real world learning contexts, but without the challenges that real world contexts can present for us as the organizers or for the learners. And then the use of artificial intelligence will start to adapt the learning to us, the learners, instead of us having to adapt to it and fit into it. Then the internet of things, wearable devices, home assistants, and all the ones that are booming in the market right now will make time, will make learning time and place even more independent than it is now. They also talk about nano learning. And I was like, what is nano learning? It sounds like a sci-fi movie. Well, it's here. They say that it's less, it's a micro learning unit that is less than one minute. That's 60 seconds or less but it's delivered and occurs over a period of weeks. What different concepts, right? Well, this goes along with the space repetition theory. We just had it on the table for you to consider looking into later. Space repetition basically says that if content and skills are visited over time, spaced out, they can be committed to long-term memory much more easily. And the final prediction, something we already see in our workplaces, in our learning environments, in our homes, is the shift from push paradigm where content is assigned, decided upon by a sage on the stage and pushed onto the learners, a shift to the pull paradigm where the learners are pulling the information and seeking the content when needed. So just to wrap things up, in this presentation, we discussed how microlearning is not a new concept, but in reality, one of the oldest forms of learning, how it has no prescribed length, but should be as short as possible, yet as long as necessary. It's one of the fastest growing educational trends worldwide, and it seems to have a very promising future. 
And Marina. although there, I was looking at the questions in the chat, sorry, they're so interesting. And although no single unified theory of micro learning currently exists, we hope that we have been able to share with you today that research on the key characteristics of micro learning are very well established. And we invite you to um, jump into them, to explore them. And if you aren't experimenting or um, creating micro learning yet, jump in, it's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have saved 10 minutes uh, for questions and comments, and there's already a lot of discussion in the chat, which we really appreciate your active participation. Any questions or comments? I'm gonna open the chat and see if I can uh, uh, share some of them. There was a question from um, Shang Ong, I think, regarding designing of modules, apart from a list of to-dos, are there any statistics on the efficacies of these different methods used in modules? Well, um, off the top of my head, I won't, I, I won't be able to provide some statistics, but I can tell you that when we look at the, just the multimedia principles alone, which are 12 of them, those are very uh, well researched and they would apply to developing uh, micro learning content in video format. And the, the science behind that is pretty well established that, you know, the short, concentrated, single objective types of uh, videos are much more effective than longer ones. One of the things that we've been trying to help our faculty peers at the university uh, do is to break up their, their video lectures into smaller units. Um, when COVID hit, you know, maybe 70% of our university faculty were not teaching online. And then over the spring break, they had to convert all of their content to uh, online. And they were putting these hour and a half long videos that were number one, poorly designed and generated. They, they were just recording themselves talking uh, for an hour and a half. And, you know, students struggled. Uh, especially in some of the hard sciences and mathematic courses, uh, there, it was very difficult. So we've been trying to preach for years uh, to take those videos and, and break them up into smaller units. One of the best examples of micro learning that I remember seeing was my daughter's college algebra class, where they, it had a digital textbook. And basically what they did in that textbook, and this is years before we were ever talking about microlearning, is they were showing these short videos uh, about a minute or two in length that showed how to do an algebraic problem. So they provided a demonstration, and then below the demonstration, they provide a worked example where they talk you through the process, and then they gave you some sample problems to try. Then another video, another worked example, and then some samples. Yes, Maria Elena, you were going to add to that? Uh, yes, I wanted to share, Rene. Those are excellent examples that Rene actually had a slide on studies that were conducted on how that showed the, the numbers of how the attention span goes down the longer the videos or the micro learning is. But we decided based on time that, that it would be too much. So there is a lot of research out there. Um, and because again, if, if we look back at the history, micro learning is longer than we, than we thought. Uh, Robert in the chat, Feeney shares that MIT research shows that our brains only focus on one thing at a time. So if you look at, you know, organizations like MIT, uh, De Felice, uh, Carl Kapp, there is research out there, studies that have been done on the effectiveness and the impact. Some show no statistically significant difference, uh, others do. So it's a matter of going through the research and, and looking at it. That's a very good question. That's a whole like, other hour presentation, but it is a very important question. If we're gonna do it, is it worth it? If Go I ahead. Just quick, Shang, in, in the, um, the no, the yeah. Um, ah. Just at the, <laughs> at the end of session one, just before you end it, there is um, a little section that has, um, 14 interesting pieces of research on micro learning. So there may be some statistics in there that may be of interest to you as well. All right. Um, I've got a question, if I may. Thank you. Uh, we often talk about pedagogy, but I saw in your, you had a little table where you had, where you mentioned andragogy. 
it's really hard to say because it's such an odd sounding word. It is. Uh, <laughs> and I've been reading a little bit um, through through Ben actually um, about Noel and this idea. Yes. Of Andrew. The adult how, learning. How, the adult yeah. learning principles. And that seems really. Um, that seems a really quite a close alignment or affinity with micro learning. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? And I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that question, but I feel there's more in there between those two. Absolutely. Um, if, if you haven't looked into Knowles, please do an andragogy. Um, he made a distinction between andragogy, uh, fo focusing on adult learners and, uh, and young learners, pedagogy. And um, it's, it's very easy reading, which I love. And he talks about, uh, I can't remember how many principles or, or uh, principles he has, but it, it needs to be relevant. And I'm trying to Google it uh, to see uh, some of the others that he has, but uh, definitely it's something that's easy, you know, easy, fun reading and uh, yeah, some of the things that uh, it, that it's Andrew self Goji, that it, it it has a lot. I'm sorry, Janine, it has a lot of the characteristics that we mentioned here: uh, self-directed, independent learning, relevant. Yeah, adult learners are not uh, tied down to a you know in the in the old days you know pretty much the universities kind of ran things like the post office at least in the United States where. We don't have to have customer service. We don't have to be nice. You have to take our courses and if there's not many other games uh, in town. So if you don't take it from us, tough. But now with online education and people being able to learn you know, from anywhere at any time, now you're starting to hear a lot about customer service in education. All of the theories that apply to andragogy in general definitely should be taken into consideration when developing micro learning because you know adult learners are very busy and oftentimes with their family responsibilities work responsibilities they may not be able to uh to really dedicate a lot of time to things so they don't want to be their time wasted so i just want to thank you very much um, for being the, the first session ever of um the micro learning meetup. Uh, so this is a momentous moment. So uh, so thank you so much. Um, thank you.